Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the cardio oncology session. My name is Kaya Verich, and I am the moderator for this session. Our presenter, sorry, is Dr. Dr. Canetti is a professor of medicine who specializes in cardio oncology, cardiac imaging, and women's heart health. She directs the cardio oncology clinic at the University of Minnesota campus and has research interests in prevention, early diagnosis, and cardiac toxicity caused by chemotherapy and radiotherapy. I would also like to introduce Erica Rex. She will be working with Dr. Canetti to um, represent the patient perspective in this discussion today. Erica is a childhood cancer survivor of Hodgkin's lymphoma of 28 years. And in 2019, she discovered she had stage four metastatic breast cancer through routine screening. Erica has been a thriver for the past 4.5 years. Erica is also a registered nurse with M Health Fairview, and her background is in pediatric oncology. She currently works with a pediatrician in the uh, clinic side on a pilot focusing on uh, providing care to children with complex needs. Erica is also a wife and a mother, and she recently took time traveling to view the solar eclipse in Missouri. Before we kick things off, just a couple of ground rules. The goal of this session is really to help people feel better, more hopeful, and less alone in their survivorship story. We are not going to talk about specific diagnoses or treatments or talk about medical advice specifically. We are not going to talk about side effect management and we're also not going to talk about practical problems. For example, work, child care, medical system navigation. With that, we are very um, excited to have you here. Thank you for spending your Saturday with us. Thank you also to the online audience and for those of you online, we do have a moderator. So please feel free to add your questions in the Q&A box. And with that, we'll have um, Q&A at the end here. But with that, I want to turn over to Dr. Canetti. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, thank you all for being here. It's a lovely day. Uh, and we're here to celebrate people like Erica and all of you. Um, and uh, this is uh, a good segue to this slide about, I mean, I have no disclosure. So today, I'm just hoping to sort of um, bring some awareness of um, um, cardiac issues that might arise during um, the survivorship phase um, in uh, patients with uh, cancer. Um, so we've made great strides. Um, we have um, an increased uh, number of uh, cancer survivors in the United States projected to grow up to about 26 million in 2040, thanks to all the early detection, the, uh, um, the targeted therapies, and ways we could um, identify and monitor other comorbid conditions uh, during this journey. Um, and um, and, and um, this has sort of been the impetus for, um, uh, for programs such as cardio-oncology. Um, from the very early years of uh, clinical observations of heart damage uh, from radiation in the 1920s uh, to uh, reports of cardiac enlargement associated with uh, adriamycin, which is anthracycline in the 1960s, we've made great strides. And uh, this field of cardio-oncology has now evolved into sort of a subspecialty providing comprehensive cardiovascular care to patients with cancer and also those uh, who are in the survivorship phase. Um, so one way to look at the cardio-oncology field is um, a paradigm of looking at cardiovascular effects stemming from uh, chemotherapy and radiation. And, um, uh, and I, I'll, clearly, it's not 100%. Not everybody who gets chemotherapy or radiation lands up with heart disease. Um, and I would say the current estimates for someone uh, with sort of breast cancer therapy, prior reports were up to one in five um, had some, uh, some issues with the heart. But this current day and age with all the screening that we do and the monitoring we do, it's significantly come down to about two to five percent. Um, but there are other uh, therapies that could affect the heart muscle, the lining of the heart, the vasculature, the blood vessels in the heart, 
Um, and all of you in the audience might recognize um, uh, most of these uh, drug therapies here, uh, as you, may, you or your family members may have received this. Um, so anthracycline is sort of the most studied of these um, uh, chemotherapy agents that causes heart disease, and that's sort of what set the stage for cardio-oncology, if you will, years ago, that can affect, um, can cause some damage to the cardiac myocytes, which are the heart cells, and lead to heart failure. And other therapies, such as HER2-directed therapy, trastuzumab, uh, pertuzumab could potentially also affect the heart uh, function. Uh, uh, medications, uh, chem chemotherapy uh, agents used to treat my, uh, multiple myeloma um, can also cause stiffening of the heart muscle and some heart failure, et cetera. Some can mediated heart, mediate heart disease through causing arrhythmias. Um, and some can directly, if some chemotherapy agents, the targeted tyrosine <laughs> kinase inhibitors or the small molecule oral chemotherapy agents can affect the, the vasculature and cause high blood pressure. Uh, and the radiation um, effects can be very latent, 15, 20 years out from the time of treatment or even... Um, uh, longer in some cases or sooner uh, can affect the heart valves. They can lead to stenosis or leaky valves. They can affect the lining of the heart muscle. But, but the intent of this slide is not to scare everybody, but just to sort of bring awareness. Um, but the other, I want to take a step back. The other paradigm that we are exploring is also uh, that of and not just the, the treatment effects causing heart disease, but also in, patient, in, in individuals with heart disease causing cancer. Um, and why might that be the case? That's because of some of the shared risk factors that we are now learning are sort of uh, bringing these two very diverse um, heart disease and uh, cancer that, that we thought were very diverse entities. Uh, that is sort of unifying this, and, and inflammation may be a common mediator uh, that's promoting some of these um, modifiable risk factors such as tobacco, obesity, physical inactivity, hypertension, uh, diabetes, et cetera, causing both cancer and heart disease. And there's a sort of a bi-directional risk, if you will. Um, the good news is, uh, good news is that uh, you could modify this. You could treat this and hopefully have an impact on the incident um, cancer rates and also uh, improve overall survival in cancer uh, patients. Uh, this is just um, uh, just to sort of look at uh, this whole inter uh, interplay of heart disease and uh, and um, uh, cancer uh, through a through a different lens, uh, looking at the reverse paradigm, if you will, uh, which uh, and studies like this are, are, are being um, uh, reported where there is a higher risk of um, cancer in patients who have atherosclerotic heart disease. There's a higher risk of cancer in patients who have had heart failure, et cetera. So the, the signal is pretty strong uh, with some of these studies that, are, um, uh, are, uh, that, we're, uh, that we're seeing. Uh, and why is it important that we study heart disease and cancer? Because they are the number one and two killers in both uh, men and women. Um, so it's uh, to make people live longer, I think uh, we've made some good strides, um, is, uh, is making a, a real dent and reducing the risk of not only heart disease, but also, or the, uh, the occurrence of heart disease, but also um, diagnosing cancer and treating that uh, without needing to interrupt therapies. Um, so in that regard, so looking at cardiovascular surveillance for a cancer survivor, what does that really mean, right? So, so some of the key components of that is, is sort of just promoting, first of all, just promoting awareness of cardiovascular risk, that there is a risk that exists uh, after one receives chemotherapy and radiation therapy, and educating our patients at, at the outset 
that what, what, what are you to look for? And so the signs and symptoms of heart disease, when I use the term heart disease, I'm using that as a very broad term. I'm using both heart failure and also um, 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 problems with the, uh, the rhythm and um, also the pipes uh, that supply the heart muscle. Um, so outlining um, a monitoring strategy for early detection of heart disease, and some of these are actually imposed by the FDA before they, um, before they approve these medications. So cardiac safety monitoring is very essential. Not, and that's sort of how some of these diabetes medications have sort of made it into the heart failure regimen now, such as Jardians and Farsiga. You might see that advertised on TV. And why are we using that in heart failure management? Heart failure is weakening of the heart muscle. That's cardiomyopathy. And if that goes unrecognized, untreated, that can lead to heart failure, which is fluid buildup and clinical heart failure. So, but we, we're actually using diabetes medications to treat that, and why so? That's because of the monitoring that was put into place before these drugs were released into the market that really clearly showed a very strong signal of improved cardiac outcomes in these patients. So we use that not only in diabetic patients, but also in non-diabetic patients. So that's sort of giving you a little gist on the evolution of some of these, uh, of these therapies that have so uh, evolved from just beta blockers and uh, ACE inhibitors these days. We have a, a huge armamentarium of drugs that we use to treat um, a decline in the heart function. Uh, so that's sort of um, what I wanted to, I mean, I, um, you know, I may have overemphasized the, uh, the monitoring strategy, but that's sort of how things uh, come to be. Uh, and I think also educating our patients about, um, and everybody, about you know, providing guidance, I should say, of healthy living is, is a key component of uh, cardiovascular surveillance in cancer patients. I have a couple of slides here sort of just outlining um, I mean, without getting into the specifics of the types of um, uh, monitoring strategies we use for specific cancer types, just to give you um, sort of a, a, a 30,000 um, feet uh, overview of who are the patients at increased risk for developing cardiac dysfunction, uh, individuals who receive high-dose anthracyclines such as for lymphoma and sarcoma. Um, with uh, doxorubicin of greater than 250 milligrams per meter squared, high dose um, radiation therapy where heart is in the treatment field, and a combination of chemotherapy, radiation, um, and even when the when the chemotherapy doses uh, doses small, having other uh, cardiac risk factors such as um, <clears throat> smoking, hypertension, diabetes. Uh, cholesterol issues um, can compound the risk. Um, again, I would take this age greater than 60, greater than 60, okay, but equal to 60 as uh, with a grain of salt, uh, because you know these days we we do have. Uh, uh, I mean, we have to recognize the concept of healthy aging, which uh, which is um, which is a, a growing uh, recognizable. A subset of uh, our uh, aging population. Um, and um, during the screening, if, uh, if there is evidence of compromised heart function, either because of a previous heart attack or valve problems, et cetera, who need to have chemotherapy, they are at high risk. Uh, and using both anthracycline and trastuzumab in, in, sequ in sequence, um, requires some increased monitoring because they're at risk for heart failure. Um, I, I, I alluded to this already in terms of some of the preventive strategies that uh, we, uh, we undertake to minimize the risk, even before initiation of therapy, um, <clears throat> screening and optimizing medical therapy for some of the modifiable cardiovascular risk factors such as hypertension, diabetes, cholesterol. Quitting smoking would be helpful, and and taking some ownership and and incorporating some physical activity um, in whatever uh, form of fashion one could engage in. 
And then there are these uh, sort of baseline cardiac testing um, that is r most oftentimes routinely instituted in patients undergoing chemotherapy or radiation therapy um, as sort of a baseline, for the most part, I would say. Um, so what are the things that we commonly do? And nothing too fancy. You start off with an electrocardiogram. This is an example of that, a snapshot here, that gives uh, um, your treating physicians an idea of uh, what the heart rate is, what, uh, what the heart rhythm is. Are, are there any previous signs of a heart attack? Um, and it's, it's a sensitive tool, but not a very specific tool. So um, some of the uh, oral chemotherapy agents um, can prolong some of these intervals, so we need to get this routinely until there is some stability that's established. Uh, there are some cardiac imaging that's oftentimes undertaken. So this is an example of an echocardiogram, an ultrasound of the heart. Uh, and this is looking at the left ventricle and uh, looking at it in different views and adding some additional uh, post-processing software to pick up any signs of early damage to the heart muscle. Uh, we call this speckle tracking. Uh, and we put some... Um, color Doppler across these valves, heart valves, to see if they are stenotic or uh, leaky or if there's obstruction, et cetera. So there's a whole host of information that's obtained from the uh, 30 minutes of the echocardiogram uh, that uh, patients are subject to at, on, uh, on screening, uh, as a screening test, I should say. In some patients, we get cardiac MRIs, if applicable. Uh, and some biomarkers. So these are sort of proteins that are released in the bloodstream. Uh, this BNP level, you might uh, have come across that. So that is an indicator of the stretch of the heart chambers uh, and essentially an indicator of heart failure. And the troponin level is an indicator of the, the cardiac cell turnover or cell, cell death, essentially. So we use that in specific cases. It's not a one-size-fits-all. Uh, I alluded to cardiac MRI, so we get not only better pictures, but it's a lengthy study. Um, you have to go in a scanner for about 45 minutes to an hour, sometimes even, uh, hopefully not uh, for everybody. But we get pictures of the heart function. We look uh, for scarring. Uh, uh, anything that's white is essentially scarred, and we also can assess for swelling in the heart muscle. So this would be very relevant, for instance, if uh, I'm worried about myocarditis or inflammation of the heart muscle when someone's undergoing immunotherapy. Um, <clears throat> uh, I think it's also... Um, upon us as clinicians to uh, harness some of the information that's already available in patient's chart when we see patients, uh, such as, uh, for instance, CT scan that's routinely done for staging purposes. Um, so as a cardiologist, what I would be interested in is to take a look and see is there any evidence of heart disease already in the CT scan that was obtained to assess for lymph nodes or lung issues. So what I'm looking here essentially is the heart arteries that come off from the aorta. Um, I'm looking for calcification. So this is sort of what a calcium score is or a CAC score that uh, uh, most of the, uh, us physicians would recommend in the realm of prevention uh, to see if you need to, if you qualify for cholesterol medications or not. But this information can be available already in oncology patients from the scanning. So if I see a lot of calcification in the heart arteries, then that's already alerting me to be careful and to pay more attention to the, uh, the risk factors that I hopefully can further modify and optimize and, uh, and uh, promote a, a good overall outcome. Um, so during treatment, there are things that we could also do. Uh, this is mostly in the, in the field of oncology, radiation oncology, et cetera. But as a cardio-oncologist, if I see risk factors, I would want the blood pressure, the cholesterol, the sugar management all, you know, optimized. Um, uh, other sort of um, strategies that we could 
uh, take into account for preventing cardiotoxicity would be to change the formulation of uh, doxorubicin, for instance. We used to, early in the days, do um, IV pushes, but we don't do that. We do continuous infusion. We could, if there is lots of doxorubicin one needs to get uh, for their cancer care, we change that to a liposomal formulation, doxyl. But that's expensive, but, but that's needed sometimes. Uh, we use this medication called uh, dexrazoxane, which is used mainly in the pediatric population to prevent against uh, chemotherapy, cardiotoxicity. It hasn't actually made it into adult um, cardio-oncology care as much because of some concerns of interference with the chemotherapy in, uh, in killing the tumor cells. Um, but radiation oncologists would, uh, would take into account um, some of these other techniques to minimize the risk of heart uh, damage uh, during the time of radiation with uh, these deep inspiration breath holes and some intensity modulator radiation therapy. Um, and I sometimes, when patients come to me, I might use some heart-related medications to prevent uh, heart, um, heart, funk, uh, heart damage. Um, and uh, may even use this if there is a mild decline in the heart function. Um, and so, so these are sort of, and, and we do continued surveillance and monitoring during treatment. Um, so, if, so for instance, if uh, breast cancer patients are undergoing HER2 therapy, we get echocardiograms, ultrasound of the heart function uh, every three months until uh, treatment is completed because there's a risk of cardiotoxicity with that. Um, and sometimes we also incorporate uh, biomarkers, uh, as I mentioned, the troponin and the BNP levels. And, and you know, there are cardiologists uh, who have interest in this field to, to co-manage patients, so cardio-oncologists, a referral to, to them would be applicable uh, when necessary, you know. Um, I think this would um, be a good takeaway. After completion of therapy, when, when patients are released back to primary care, um, should we continue to monitor the heart function and the heart assessment is a big question everybody has. And I would say yes, uh, you know, getting a cardiac function assessment about a year after completion of therapy would be a good idea to reestablish a new baseline and see if there's been a big change and if we need to, uh, to do anything about it. Um, and possibly one to two years after that to ensure that there is stability. Uh, for our folks who have had radiation therapy, th these are more latent effects. They, the, the immediate effects aren't apparent uh, in most cases. It's 10 years, seven, 10 years out. Um, so getting another cardiac function assessment 10 years out, if it hasn't been done, I think would be very important. If it's not in the heart field, if it's in the head and neck area, I think getting a carotid ultrasound uh, to make sure that the blood vessels are intact uh, would, again, not be a bad idea. And I'm sure there are some screening strategies uh, when lungs are involved, if there is lung radiation um, by the uh, pulmonologist. A uh, couple of last two slides. Um, I, I can't emphasize enough on, on uh, the importance of uh, lifestyle modification. There have been a number of studies, lots of meta-analysis indicating uh, exercise would reduce uh, mortality by 30% in our cancers, 13% uh, I would say in cancer survivors. Incorporating even 30 minutes of exercise, moderate exercise, where you're still breathless but able to carry on a conversation in single sentences five times a week I think would be very helpful. If you can't start with 30 minutes, 15 minutes, and then ramping it up would be very critical. Weight management, high, it would be helpful with weight management, sugar control, and blood pressure management, and also the cholesterol. Um, and combining this with a little bit of some, so doing a combination of aerobic and strength training, strength training mainly for bone health uh, would be very essential. Uh, even some resistance band or some light weights, I think, um, would be helpful. And paying attention to what we eat. We just had a session on nutrition and microbiome, essentially. We are what we eat. Um, and um, 
having half the plate comprised of uh, fruits and vegetables, and this is from the Harvard University um, Public um, uh, School of Health um, website, um, but having half your plate filled with fruits and vegetables and another quarter with whole grains and minimizing refined grains, red meat, and high fat uh, dairy products would be, uh, would be considered um, a promoting health, essentially. Um, and here are some tips uh, that uh, would uh, comprise uh, the different food groups that would belong um, uh, to these uh, different categories. Um, <clears throat> water is good, staying active is good. Um, so I think in summary, uh, you all would agree that cancer survivors are at an increased risk for cardiometabolic comorbidities. What do I mean by that? That's the diabetes, the obesity, high blood pressure, cholesterol. Um, and taking a patient-centered approach in management of these patients with cancer, with optimal management of these risk factors, will certainly improve the overall survival. And um, I think we've made great strides in focusing on, in focusing on CV, uh, cardiovascular screening, identifying patients at risk at the outset, and, and sort of lending a multidisciplinary care approach during the entire continuum of oncology care and survivorship is bound to sort of uh, leave us with some uh, better outcomes and, um, and uh, improved uh, survival from a cancer standpoint. Uh, I think I should, uh, I would, uh, you know, um, uh, miss an opportunity to say, so the, the, the leading cause of death uh, in cancer survivors that is not related to cancer mortality is heart disease. And I think that's no surprise to us uh, and you people in the audience. Uh, because heart disease is the number one killer. So I'll stop there, and uh, if you have any questions. All right, okay. I'm just going to add in, um, at least from a patient perspective, um, how, how much value there is in s surveillance and getting um, established with a cardiologist. Uh, as part of my cancer treatment as a child, when I was 15 years old, I had the adriamycin and I had that, uh, the radiation to my chest. I started the surveillance in my early 20s and started seeing a cardiologist. But within less than 15 years after I finished my cancer treatment, we started to find changes within my heart. Um, I was less than 30 uh, when we found my first leaky valve. And it's just an ongoing process. There's no like time frame where you're going to see the changes and then you're done. It's ongoing to the point where I still follow up with my cardiologist and we found my second leaky heart valve about two, three years ago. So it's just always a part of me. So I just highly recommend getting that surveillance and screening and establishing with a provider that you um, know and trust with your care. There was one online question. Can you ad address when a cardiac MRI would be advised? Um, so generally we reserve cardiac MRI for patients who have um, very poor acoustic windows. So what, that I, what I mean is if we can't get good pictures of the heart with an ultrasound, ultrasound is the first go-to. It's the workhorse of imaging, if you will. Um, so then we resort to MRI. But more importantly, I think we need to recognize with immunotherapy, for instance, for certain uh, cancer subgroups uh, which can affect the heart muscle, inflammation of the heart muscle, MRI would be very essential because it provides not only an assessment of the heart function, but it also looks at are there signs of inflammation within the heart muscle? Is there swelling, edema? Is there um, uh, uh, scarring, fibrosis? All of those go hand in hand with myocarditis. So in select patients, I would recommend MRI. So for most of us who've already been through treatment, um, it's too late to have that baseline surveillance. So if you never had that, and if you had, for example, radiation in the heart area, what's your recommendation after the treatment is done? How, how would you start that surveillance project, and what would the cardiac function assessment consist of? Absolutely. So I think um, and getting an EKG and, uh, um, to assess the heart uh, rhythm and heart rate would be a good first step. 
Uh, primary care physicians oftentimes can order this. So if you are established with a primary physician, I would start there and get an EKG and also ask uh, for an ultrasound of the heart, a echocardiogram. Uh, so those would at least give us an idea of, uh, of where things are. Uh, yes, ideally it would have been a year after, but that's okay. Uh, you're uh, in, uh, never too late. <laughs> so what is the function assessment that you would recommend 10 years after radiation? Uh, cardiac uh, echocardiogram, again, that would be the assessment. So I would start that as a basic screening um, uh, tool. <coughs> Hi, thank you for the great presentation. So my question is, um, how much do just, you know, a regular cardiologist, how much are they aware of this? Um, I know you're a cardio-oncologist. Um, I asked because my mom had recently had a stroke, so I went in to see a cardiologist, and, you know, we kind of talked about this, but I felt like maybe this is a good thing. I was treated as a regular person coming in, and I'm just wondering if... Um, you recommend cancer patients specifically trying to have like a cancer oncol or a cardio oncologist rather than just general cardiology. That's a great question, uh, and this keeps getting repeated all the time. So, um, but that's uh, so. I think um, at least in the cardiology community, uh, we've made a, a good effort. I would say in educating most of the cardiologists that there is such a field or there is a subset of patients who really need this extra care. Um, so most of our societies, the Heart Failure Society, the American Heart Association, so that educating the clinicians, which is probably the toughest part of it, um, um, so there are some efforts in place. Um, I would say um, cardio-oncology presence is generally in big academic centers and big large cardiology groups. But outside of that, in uh, small hometowns, et cetera, uh, you, might, um, you might have to start with a cardiologist and ask for a referral uh, to a cardio-oncology program. But usually, um, the cardio-oncology program presence is in conjunction with a comprehensive cancer center, such as the Masonic here and things. Um, but I would say, um, by and large, um, the cardiology community, um, this is sort of becoming mainstream, um, that uh, we have to be vigilant uh, for uh, not just assessment of the heart function, but also look at the vasculature and other things that um, you know, could be silent problems. Strokes, for instance, and hormonal therapy causing other issues and metabolic syndrome arising from that, et cetera. So I think uh, you're absolutely right, and I think we have to do a better job also. And I just have to, I just wanted to add in, um, if you're outside of a, a big metropolitan area that has an academic health center, um, reach out to other cancer survivors to see who they're seeing. Um, they may have great uh, suggestions. Um, they may have providers that they like and are very knowledgeable about um, uh, how to treat cancer survivors um, af after the fact. So reach out, talk to, to whomever you're in contact with, whether it be online um, support groups or in-person support groups, your, your connections on social media or just out in the community. And I, find, I found I've a lot of great providers just through that, um, that contact. Uh, thank you for the great presentation. And you just recently mentioned about immunotherapy and the impacts to our car cardio health. Can you maybe elaborate on that a little bit more? And is it specific types of immunotherapy or all types of immunotherapy? That's a great question. Um, I would say just as a, a, a broad overview on immunotherapy, the more, so heart uh, fortunately, is not a very, uh, or myocarditis. So as you know, immunotherapy, it, it, you, you rev up your own immune system to attack the tumor cells. Um, 
So when you engage your own immune system, unfortunately, you could turn against some of the organs and, uh, and myocarditis, which is inflammation of the heart muscle, could be a uh, side effect of that. But uh, fortunately, the risk of that happening is less than 1%. Uh, but when unrecognized and untreated, the fatality risk is high. So that's why it is of concern. So for instance, to just give you an idea, uh, in the New England Journal paper, which is like the big medical journal that we all strive to have a publication in, um, so there was a publication on myocarditis with just eight or nine patients. Um, but this is such a rare thing, but the fatality risk is so high with it, it's up to 70% if untreated. So that sort of caught the attention of the whole community. Um, and so generally, when I, so I, I should put that in context. So usually to make it to a, you know, a big publication, you will have thousands of patients enrolled or you have a very, very strong signal with some either improvement or detriment in therapy. Uh, but uh, the fact that it really sort of grabbed everybody's attention was uh, the fact that uh, the risk, the, the untreated risk or the fatality risk is, is high with that. Um, so that's about the, the, the prevalence of the problem. But in terms of usually with single immunotherapy, the risk is not thought to be as much, but usually when we combine immunotherapy agents, and it's really not specific to any type per se, but when you use dual agents, the risk is thought to be higher. Sorry, I couldn't quite hear what the last question was, so I'm not sure if I'm overlapping. But I'm in this category of I diagnosed in 07 with breast cancer, and now I'm having issues. I just had a cardiac MRI to follow my some echoes. Not real pleased with those results. What hope is there for me for the damage that has already been done, or for those of us where the damage has been done? Years later, never had a lot of this monitoring, although yeah. I've been a patient here, <laughs> here. But we didn't have all this set up back then. You should be very Is there hopeful. hope? Of course. <laughs> I need hope. <laughs> uh, it, you should, it's up and up. It's, you, you have a very positive, you should have a very positive and a optimistic outlook. Um, the reason why I say that is um, even with just as the um, oncology armament the targeted therapies, the explosion of therapies that there has been and options available, um, cardiology, on the cardiology front, we know how to treat this. We know how to recognize the problem and adequately treat. And, and the therapies available have also sort of expanded on the cardiology front. Um, and I'm just hoping the fact that the way, uh, you know, when I see you, I can tell you you're not in acute heart failure. So that in and of itself is a, is a very positive thing. You're able to talk. You're able to come to a... Uh, a gathering like this, and uh, so that's a good sign. Uh, so uh, if there are other perturbations, uh, we could certainly put you on a good surveillance uh, strategy and continue to monitor you. <laughs> My cardiologist was in Turkey for a month, so... Uh, I know who you're talking about. I know exactly who you're talking about, and she's a good one. I wore her out. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Kennedy. Thanks for your presentation. Um, Tara Rick, I see patients in cancer survivorship. So one scenario that I often see is patients who have had radiation as maybe an adolescent or young adult and then anthracycline chemotherapy. And so I make recommendations for their primary care for the monitoring and to be aggressive about lipids. But oftentimes I see cholesterol being borderline and you know, them getting instructions to, you know, work on diet and exercise. How aggressive do we need to be? When you talk about optimizing lipids, are we talking about when we start seeing elevated total cholesterol, LDL, should they be treated? Or can we, do we have a little wiggle room? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And as you probably also know, our young, um, uh, our uh, childhood cancer survivors are still very young. 
and oftentimes are reluctant to start therapies. But I mean, even before we get to therapies, I think um, uh, obtaining probably one of the ways that I try to address this is perhaps look for other stig stigmata of uh, hardening of the blood vessels. <laughs> either a carotid ultrasound, looking for what we call the IMT thickness or intimal thickness, or a calcium score. Um, if the calcium score is, the calcium score is what I, uh, I showed here. Uh, I mean, this is not a, a dedicated calcium score, but this is harnessing the information that's already available on a CT scan. So essentially, this is what we look at with calcium score, is we look for calcification and, and, and figure out what the... Um, percent calcification is and, and sort of, um, so if I see uh, some calcification already in a 30 year old, that will give me a pause. And I'd say I need to be aggressive. And I would also take into account the family history because we know cholesterol is, um, uh, is heavily dictated by our genetics um, and how we handle cholesterol and how we uh, express uh, receptors in our liver and how we metabolize fat. So all of that is genetically predetermined. So if, if, um, if I see a, a, a cancer survivor who is slightly obese, uh, oh, and this day and age, hopefully nobody's smoking still, uh, you know, in the survivorship phase. But I take into account all of that um, and if there's a strong family history, then I might actually choose to treat them with a low-dose cholesterol medication. Uh, recognizing the fact that they probably will be on it for a good bit of time, uh, 30, 40 years, 50 years even. So subject, and we don't have data, unfortunately. I wish we had, like, but it's hard to fund those kinds of studies for 50-year outcomes, 30-year outcomes. So. That it, it is challenging, but I would say um, probably we have to personalize a little bit and we can't um, incorporate what the guidelines say because they will never meet the criteria for, I'm sure you're like frustrated. Like what do I, where do I look for data? Uh, so you kind of just uh, do a, sort of a multi-pronged approach and then take into account all of this and decide. Any other questions? Oh, ahead. Now, with those uh, young uh, adults that are surviving and are on those statins, it, you know, as they're planning their, their families, is that something that has to be taken in, in, into consideration where they have to come off that medication? Uh, that's a good question. Usually, um, I don't think we have very strong data on statin therapy and pregnancy, for instance. If it is in that critical age group, I probably wouldn't. Uh, unless I, I'm hard pressed and if the LDL cholesterol is close to 200, not the total cholesterol but the subfraction, uh, that's very rare. And um, so we, one, we don't have data with pregnancy and statin therapy, so I, that would give me a pause. I would not initiate. But the bigger question may be someone who has a little bit of decline in the heart function and if we start them on a, say for instance, a beta blocker, an ACE inhibitor, and, and, and uh, uh, they decide to pursue pregnancy, I would certainly stop uh, the therapy. ACE inhibitors are not recommended. So medications such as lisinopril, ramipril, all of those are not recommended during pregnancy. So that does become a very practical <laughs> challenge. Um, but I would counsel them. I would, I would have a very frank discussion. And we have had survivors who have gone on to have very successful pregnancies. We do monitor them very, that brings up a whole different surveillance strategy in these patients. Um, I, I, I see them every three, every trimester, make sure their heart function's okay, that everything else, you know, their blood pressure, et cetera, is good. And we've had good success with safe delivery, normal delivery is recommended, and uh, they've all done well. Um, patients who've had radiation therapy can have some issues when they become pregnant, um, but I think now we have the, uh, the maternal fetal medicine 
folks are also aware of this. Uh, so I would, that's when I probably would monitor the patients closely in an academic center, like a place where there are, there's opportunity for a teamwork uh, and have a positive impact in that. Any other questions? Well, thank you all. Oh, yes, sorry. Thank you for your presentation. Um, my question is wondering if there's a difference between left-sided or right-sided breast cancer in relation to cardio-oncology. Great question, great question. Um, yes, and it has been studied. Left side is closer to the heart, so uh, it, it, is a pro it renders a higher risk uh, for heart problems. Right side is away from the heart. Um, because the, the border of the heart sits right below the, uh, the breastbone, if you will, on the right side. So if the radiation is to the right side, um, then the risk to the heart, the scatter radiation to the heart is considerably smaller. Um, still see people with right, with right sided breast cancer with cardiac problems? There could be, yes. There could be. So how much greater is how much greater is the risk for a person who's had left-sided radiation for an occurrence of heart disease than the regular population? Left-sided breast cancer radiation? Yeah. Okay. So it's thought to be double, more than double. And what does that mean? So there is a base. Everybody is at risk for heart disease, right? So even when we talk about stroke, there is a baseline risk of about 1% to 2%. So this is doubling of the risk, tripling of the risk. So if there is, so it, it's dose dependent, so it's, it's not, there isn't a sort of a one answer to, so if there are risk factors, the risk doubles. There is, the higher the radiation dose, so it's dependent on a lot of these modifying factors. If there's left-sided radiation, if there's cardiac risk factors, and if there's a lot of radiation, the risk could be sixfold. Um, increase from the baseline risk of 1% to 2%. But this is also data, I would, I would caution you when you um, interpret this or apply this in that, um, <clears throat> so these are data from 1950s and 60s that were reported in uh, the 2000s after several years of follow-up. Uh, and our radiation techniques have significantly improved these days. So with all the improvements that I had alluded to, where our radiation oncologists play, uh, uh, pay uh, exquisite attention to moving the heart away from the radiation field. So in a sense, we don't know, honestly, what the current day radiation uh, strategies, what kind of a risk they pose. And and the thought is that obviously it will be much, much smaller. Well, thank you all so much for your exciting and engaging questions and conversations. <laughs> Dr. Canetti, thank, thank you, you so thank much. You. Erica, thank you so much for both sharing your expertise and sharing your time.